So please join me in welcoming John Scott. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> okay, so I've only got 330 slides to go, so I'll uh, be quick. Um, so um, when I was first asked about this, I was asked to kind of do a, a thought leadership piece. So it's kind of hard because I don't do much thinking anymore. I mainly just do more running around. So um, I'll just kind of jump right into it. So w w when I first was sitting around a couple weeks ago thinking about what, what, what was I going to talk about, um, I kind of just started thinking about, well, you know, in general, the government open source software, the open technologies, you know, wh where is it going? And, and really a lot of the government, as with everything, is being driven by the private sector. Um, the government doesn't lead anymore outside of some very specific areas um, that are classified um, in IT. Just period. I think that we're still getting over the government's still getting over that that they're they, they are an 800 pound gorilla in the room, in terms of uh, buying stuff, but not in the global market. And so, really, the, the government's being forced down this path. So, I kind of look at, at everything as basically three things: people, process, and technology. Um, you know, first thing is basically you know the, the trends with people. Um, you know, frankly, you know, the, the generation that's coming up um, is pretty impatient. Wants it now. Like a, like a three-year-old toddler that I have at home. Um, doesn't want to wait, doesn't want to sit around waiting for software licenses to show up. Um, I've been on a number of programs where you sit and you wait and uh, waiting for a license to show up, waiting for a key to show up so you can get something to work. And that's, that's no longer acceptable with basically the missions that uh, I work on. I, I primarily work on uh, defense and intelligence community kind of work. So it's, it's no longer acceptable to be waiting for FedEx to deliver you a, a key so your software will work. Um, so basically the impatient. And also, more, more importantly, um, this is the generations coming up now that are, that, are, that are the developers are basically raised on open source software. And most of the development tools are, are free and openly available and accessible. So you've got this whole idea of basically coming up through universities and, and learning. Everything is available online for free. It's openly accessible. So, so basically the trend with people is they're expect, expecting this behavior kind of going forward. Um, developers, um, the good ones are lazy. They don't want to rework problems that have already been solved previously. Um, a, lot, a lot of times government will basically pay government, I'm sure everybody knows this, will pay developers to recreate, resolve existing problems over and over and over again. I see this on multiple pro projects. Um, I think with sequestration, maybe, that, maybe some of that might stop, but uh, so as, as trends that are outside. Um, technology, uh, you see, you're seeing kind of the need for speed, basically software development is changing rapidly. Um, you know, Groups like Etsy, Amazon, you know, web services, I mean, they're constantly changing their platforms and their programs as they're deployed. They're not waiting along, you know, they're, they're out of this model of deploying every six months. They're updating when things need to get, need to get built, need, needs to get deployed. And so this whole idea of continuous um, integration, continuous delivery is really becoming much, much, much closer to the fore. Um, as I said before, the tooling, a lot of the software, best software development tools around software development are open source. They're just out there, they're openly available. Um, it's kind of kill, actually open source kind of killed the, the development market for software tools since, they're all, since they are all basically open source. And also you're seeing this commoditization um, maturity of open source software. Um, kind of the way I like to explain this is, uh, is anybody in here familiar with the OODA loop? So the, the OODA loop is basically, it's a, it's a military term, it's called the observe, orient, decide, act. And the whole idea came from fighter air, from, uh, from John Boyd in uh, how he described how uh, fighter aircraft should, should function. And the basic idea is if you can get inside the decision cycle of your enemy, you can make decisions faster than they can so that you can basically win the battle. And really what, what you're seeing now with uh, you know, open source software is really inside the, closed OODA, loop, inside the OODA loop of uh, closed technologies, uh, mainly because you, know, you can fix things yourself. Um, you know, if you've got the open source software, it's out there, there's, there's a problem with it. Um, if you have the resources, you can, you, can, you can fix it yourself. You don't have to wait for marketing team, the advertising team to kind of all get on the same page to then do an official bug patch or, you know, release only on Tuesdays. You can do it right then and there. So what you're seeing is the, the, the cycle rate of open source software being a lot, a lot faster than, uh, than in closed source software. So, you know, really what's special is becoming commodity. Um, in, the, in the area that I work in, a lot of, you know, command control software is becoming a lot more um, commercial. Is taking over that space. I'm also seeing um, things like sensors and ISR being overtaken by th stuff that's out in the commercial market. Um, you know, just this this whole dr drive towards commoditization of software is just only continuing. You know, going forward. These are just some boring slides I found. Um, in numbers, if you want numbers, you can download those a little later. Um, somebody, uh, Stuart Cohen, had done a, done some work at OSDL around just what areas and, and some some cost savings that they've seen at various companies about, uh, you know, by, by being able to switch off of uh, closed source licensing. And the, the 
you know, depending on the, the strategy you take, the, the savings can be quite substantial. And I've seen, I'm seeing that as well. Old chart, you know, just the, the number of applications that are becoming open source is basically just moving forward. So next thing is, where is the government? Um, I kind of look at this as basically, you know, use, modify, and create open source software or open data. Um, open data has become kind of the shock troops of, of openness, um, I think as Beth Novak said. Um, you know, and open source is really the logistic supply chain behind, behind there. So kind of as a continuum of looking at data and technology, you know, data, you have this whole idea of, you know, the government's just basically posting a lot of data right now, slowly starting to interact with it and combine. You know, open source software the same way. There's a lot of, there, there's use of it going on. Some modifications in some agencies and some people are actually kind of interacting with the communities. Um, we're slowly getting into this, this, this model of the government being able to kind of create and release. So just my, my swag of where things, where I see things are, I think open government, government data being open and openly accessible is basically out probably a little bit more towards the interaction phase. There are some sites, the FCC's got some pretty good, good sites about actually interacting with government data um, instead of just downloading it or having a spreadsheet. Um, government technology, using use of open source software is really more in the use phase. Um, there are some great um, government agencies that are kind of much further ahead about creating software that actually releases it open source software, but that's kind of the next, the next phase that we, we see going forward. So with people and technology, um, you know, government, government employees and, and contractors is basically a big aging retirement work workforce that's going forward, and I don't think a lot of those people are going to re get replaced just because with, with, with costs going forward. I mean, sequestration is probably going to increase the rate of that. And technology, there's lots of legacy software systems and code out there. Um, if anybody's been following the, the VISTA um, work that's been going on between the VA and, and DOD, um, I mean, all that is old mumps code that's basically 30 years old, so I'm not sure what's going to happen with that, but there's other deeper systems that have more legacy. Um, but really, in terms of where the government is, um, the bigger problem is process. Um, you, you know, in terms of culture, I, I throw culture in process as well, regulations and law. Um, and we have this, there, there is this, this uh, problem between hardware and software and acquisitions. Um, basically, a lot of the acquisition system is set up, was set up basically World War II to buy steel um, and not, not, not set up to buy and acquire and develop and deploy modern type software. So I kind of look at, at uh, basically, one second. So a lot of software, a lot of the, the acquisition system was set up to do one thing. That's measure twice, cut once. Except we've gotten to the point now where we're basically measuring a thousand times, building a thousand reports. Um, four or five years later, we, we then deploy out the, the RFP, and by that point, the software is the, what we're trying to buy is now available as a subscription from Amazon probably at $9.99 on, you know, per month. So basically, that you've got these, these assumptions where, you know, it's basically very industrial versus digital, steel versus bits kind of model, and, you know, land warfare versus cyber warfare. You know, second thing is the government tends to allow people to create knowledge monopolies around sources of code um, and not make those openly accessible to either the defense, you know, my, my community, the defense community, or the wider uh, public that paid for it. So you have this kind of, you know, basically a locking up of all this knowledge. You know, and so as, as a result, I, I basically contend that you know, the intellectual property regime for the government needs to change um, because it's basically set upon this whole idea of ownership of things, which makes sense if you're trying to build, you know, 10,000 tanks to win a land war in Asia. But it doesn't make any sense, and you have to go out to the markets and get bonds and raise billions of dollars to build a plan. But software doesn't require that type of investment. Um, you know, I mean, this is, this, is, this is the battle. This is the DOD's acquisition chart for building systems. Um, it is a four by six wall chart. And it, the first time I actually saw it, um, the first, one actually, the first time I saw it on the wall chart, I was standing there kind of looking at it in, in total amazement. It's a great piece of art. Oops, sorry. And uh, somebody came out of the office and said, oh, that's already out of date. That, that's version 6.3 or something. We're at 7.2 now or something. So um, as, as the gubbies in the room who are in defense can attest, it's a long, painful process that uh, on average takes about, how long, Tim, to get to RFP? Three years? <laughs> So imagine trying to do this with a software-only project, which is why you end up seeing software projects getting canceled all the time. You know, it's, it's bad. So the definition of cathedral. So uh, like I said before, um, intellectual property really, I think, is the key for a lot of this in software. If you don't figure out ways of letting, of actually kind of tactically deploying your intellectual property to make it, make, have it have an impact on your program and getting it out there, it doesn't make any sense. So I had to throw a gun up here. It's a military since I was who I work for. Um, we allow this behavior in software. We, don't, we, we basically say software is locked off to, to, to developers. You can't touch it if it's the military 
or in the government. Um, but if we sold, if, if, the if the military bought guns this way and, and the manufacturer said you can't do that, we would say, well, that's BS. We're not, we, we have to be able to kind of clean modify out in the field. But yet with software, we accept this behavior going forward. So I think there's, that has to be a bit of a mind shift in terms of um, how we do things. So next, in terms of law, I think that, that Congress is slowly waking up to this fact. I mean, they're not just waking up, but they're kind of really frustrated with the fact that um, IT costs never seem to go down unless they you know, squeeze them down. So they've been look, there's been lots of exasperation about trying to help solve the problem for the government. I'm not sure if having Congress involved is the best idea, but it's kind of where we are. Because um, it, it is a big, dumb, blunt hammer um, coming down. So you have things like, uh, I mean, the Senate did, did some good work in terms of actually saying open source software is good to use and you should be looking at using it. Um, ICE is looking at, there's a new reform bill on the Hill right now. Um, I guess it's going to be out probably 2013 or 2014 for, uh, I think 2013 for the new bill. So. There's some good stuff going on there, but uh, you know, as with all things, politicians don't get nuance, and I don't think that they get software development either. Um, the flip side is I think that the federal government's been getting a lot more work around deploying and getting policy out there around open source software. Um, you know, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, they're probably the most forward-leaning in terms of agencies, but that's also because they were only created about a year ago, so their policy was all from scratch. Um, they actually say in their policy for, for software that, you know, we will, we will release it to the public when we can as a first order of, basically the default is release to open unless there's some reason why we can versus a lot of agencies have to kind of fight to get their stuff out there as I'm doing with other federal agencies. Um, just a new project that came up a couple weeks ago, um, NIH is basically, they're, they're getting ready to I think open source about 60 or 70 different uh, um, kind of cancer uh, related software and tools. So just, just I think there's, there's, a, there's this need of getting stuff out there that, people, that that's only growing. Um, DOD policy, okay to use, won't hurt, 2009. Memos, hopefully everybody here knows what open source software is. That was in there, so that, that helps a lot, I think, in terms of getting, getting adoptance and moving things forward. Um, Beth was also helpful a lot in getting a lot of the uh, open uh, OMB memo and uh, work out of, out of her office. So it was really good, I'm sorry Beth, I had to leave early. There's been a lot written on open source software, how to use it, how to get out there, how to, how to keep it rolling. Um, Less on the policy side, more on just kind of directives, and here's how you might go down this path. A lot of great work out there with Drupal, obviously. I mean, the White House, DHS, you know, the House. Let me see what else. Um, Terminus State's been slowly moving to open source day. They run an open source, an open source um, day. NASA's, I think, is, is, is another one of those great agencies that's really been pretty forward-leaning in terms of what they've been doing with open source for years. Now, I think, um, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to get off their, their own, they have their own NASA open source software license they're trying to get off of, but they've been really good about the Spa War Atlantic's been doing a lot of great work there, um, as well as the VA with Vista. We'll see where all that, that mess ends up. Um, yeah, yeah, lots of projects. Um, even DARPA, this is kind of a project that I was a, mem I was a part of. Um, even DARPA's looking into basically how would you build vehicles using an open source software, hard, open source hardware, hardware model. So the idea would be you could share the, uh, the hardware um, designs, CAD models, things like that, schemas and things in a, in a, in a hardware, in, a, in an open source software kind of way, in a way of that you could, you could have some things that were out in the public web and then you can kind of move them up to uh, higher orders of uh, classification. So kind of a new experiment going on there in the open source hardware space out of DARPA. Um, the group I, I was a member of, we did a, 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 we did a uh, review of government policies across the, the executive branch just looking at in terms of like, you know, who's got, who's, you know, open data, open source software policies and things like that. So we're, we're, we're getting ready to redo this again in the next, uh, next few months here and see if any of those scores have changed. Because some people have now come out with more policies, but more forward leading. I mean, surprisingly, DOD actually has scored pretty high in terms of things they actually have put out there, policies they have in place. Now, whether they're followed, that's not, not here nor there. But in terms of actually things that, that actually having the ability to go out and actually release stuff, um, DOD scored pretty high. Um, so I think where, where, where will the government end, end up? So three things not to do in public. What's the first? Come on, it's pretty obvious. You, know, you don't have sex in public. What's the next one? You don't do math. I think the third, the third one is experimentation. Um, and this is basically the way that modern software is built. And I think we, what we've seen so far with a lot of the open data um, things that occur is basically it, it, it requires a certain level of maturity to put data out there and also to put software out there that may not be working right now. And that's, that's a really, I think, very scary place for the government, governments to be. 
by putting, out, putting data out there in software because there's not a lot of maturity in terms of what's out there. Software breaks, it was your software. Well, it's, it's open source. That is, the, that is the way that modern software gets built. It gets deployed a lot, you know, and it breaks. So um, I think the, the, the experimentation is going to be interesting going forward in terms of how, how to get things up and running. So where the government's going, aging workforce. But I think the good news is there's a lot of younger contractors coming in with the turnover. Frankly, I, I don't think a lot of government employees are going to be replaced. Um, technology, the churn's going to continue. The opening's continuing. Um, I think that the thing you're going to be hearing a lot about, and I think that Amazon helps a lot of this, is basically the, the whole idea of enterprise automa autom automation and continuous delivery. Um, it hasn't really made its way into government yet. Um, basically, the idea is that basically you, you can deploy systems much more rapidly, um, continuously. You're always changing them. This should hopefully help with a lot of the, the cyber problems we have. Um, also, the idea of abstraction, which that all helps with that. Um, process, I think we're going to go back to the early 90s. Let's remember the early 90s. We're going to go back to a lot more outsourcing, um, you know, A76 studies. I think a, there's going to be a lot more of this whole idea of capability will be the service coming out. Um, and less of, at least on my side, I'm hoping for less of PowerPoint charts about here's a system that we'll build for you versus here's a system we've built. You can have it at, you know, $2,000 a month or something like that. So I think that we're going to get away from this whole idea. I, I, I'm predicting kind of in five years that you won't have a lot of IT staffs in government agencies anymore. I think a lot of it will be outsourced through basically something like a cloud. Um, you, you'll have you know, super admins, and that might be about it. Um, just I think with budgets going down, people are expensive. Um, and, and really, it's what we should be doing. I mean, IT really can take the job off of a lot of people. So um, you, we're, we're seeing a lot of government projects moving from kind of this closed GOTS model into kind of community made open source software. Um, there's this thing called Ozone Software Widget Framework that's been, be, recently been released out of DoD. Um, that's now an open source, fully fledged open source software project, which is great. <coughs> so. Um, and, and there are a lot of other, a lot more software coming out of the government that's trying to move toward this community maintained model and get away, get out of the whole idea of, of locking up your intellectual property with one vendor when you've, when you've built a brand new system. So how to help? Um, what I keep telling, telling CIOs, you really need to work on your, on your, on how to build your, build up your enterprise options um, versus locking your stuff into one software product with one closed format that requires that software product to get to that closed format document you have. Um, and, and enterprise automation, which basically helps all that stuff. Um, edu edu educating the contracting officers, because actually that's where the rubber, rubber meets the road. Um, I can't tell you how many times I go through open source 101 with a contracting officer that it's not crazy. It's just the normal model you've always had. You're just not paying a license anymore. Or you're paying a much lower license or a different type of license. You're paying a subscription license instead of basically an upfront fee and then a very low O&M cost over, over the longer haul. Um, you know, this, this is, this is a, a requirement, but it's always ignored. It's basically review of open source software solutions that are out there. Um, open source software companies typically, if they don't have a company behind it, they don't have a sales force. So a lot of people just assume, you know, the only, only vendors who show up who want to sell the solution are the ones who have sales forces. So I think that actually going out and using Google and searching for things helps, can help a lot. And at least use open source software as a way to negotiate. Um, I, you know, as a way of just, just cramming down your costs, just threaten to go open source software and you might be able to save some money. Um, so that's kind of my, my, my wrap up. <clears throat> so uh, it's not free. Um, if you're going to use open source software, please, you have to find some way to sponsor development and keep the technology fresh, otherwise it'll get stale. Um, you know, either through subscriptions or services, the cost can be a lot less than what you're paying for it right now. Um, but you've got to pay for it. You know, if you want to use it, you've got to pay for it somehow. Figure out some way of paying for it. Um, I, a lot of people think it's, oh, it's, it's free and open source software, I don't have to pay for it, vendors show up, and then they go away, and then they're shocked when some vendor says, well, you need somebody to fix that for you. Well, you know, people, people working, you know, in the garages or, or at universities aren't going, to work on, aren't going to work on your bug unless you pay them. So you've got to pay. It's just easier and faster to do it. Um, software is a renewable resource. We need to treat it like it is, which means getting the intellectual property rights correct and released back out to the open source software. Um, it's really become central. I mean, if software stopped working, I said, you know, in general, if software, software stopped working, things wouldn't work anymore, period, in the government, in the military, in the IC. Um, but yet we kind of treat software as this uh, kind of third class, fourth class citizen in terms of things that we care about because it's not sexy. Um, uh, don't fork open source software for solely for government use unless you have really good, really, really, really good uses, really good uses, really good reasons. Um, I 
see this a lot. People just say, well, great, we'll use open source software, and they immediately fork it, take it off in their own direction. And three, three years later, they're out of, completely out of the baseline, and they're paying, spending a ton of money to keep it. So you know, use, use vendors, encourage vendors to start up. I mean, I mean if you want to look at creating small companies, create, encourage small companies to get, create around open source software to support those projects. Uh, so I, I'd say in general, open source software is winning. It's just not evenly distributed yet. There's lots of agencies that don't get it. There's also some, some great agency, agencies that do get it. Um, and there's a huge, there's a, you know, th this, this chart could have been 10 times filled with, with, uh, with things, but there's a great amount of stuff, you know, not least a bunch is Alfresco. Thanks for having me come speak. Um, and I think Alfresco kind of shows the model of how things are maturing much more, much more rapidly. Um, they actually are approved for records management. You know, I think that you're, you're going to see this model kind of going forward. And, and this is where you have to actually really pay for, for vendors. I mean, no open source software company is going to go out and get records management software unless some, some government employee, some, some, some group says, we, we would like you to get this record management cert. So you need to pay for that, period. Or get the company to cut, or, or give them a contract. So you need to figure out a way of engaging with them going forward. So with that, um, this is the group that I run. So if you're interested in kind of this has become almost all things open source software in the government, not just uh, military related. It's an open Google group, so you can just join up and go there and find, find, the, find, the, uh, find the link. And with that, uh, you know, keep coding open source. That's all I have. No idea. I, 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 I work with the Alfresco guys, but I don't know what their longer term plans are and where they're going. I, I, I know, so the, the, the question was, uh, what, what are Alfresco's longer term plans for you, Liz? Or short, short term, short term plans for Alfresco. Well, so, so the, the, the question was the, the short-term EULA's, I guess, direction for Alfresco. Is there someone from Alfresco in the room who can answer that? Maybe not. They're all outside. So I, 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 I encourage you to find the Alfresco people and then ask them about what, what they're doing. I know that they're working on um, plans. I mean, if they're on the, the Fed ramp and things like that, they definitely have a planning process for where they're going with that. Um, I, I don't work exclusively with Alfresco, so I'm not sure. Sorry. Any more questions? We have another hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you hear so much about all of these different open standards, you know, even within government. Do you see like a governing body that's going to oversee, like Department of Defense seems to have a certain set of standards that they define as open? You look in certain agencies on the civilian side. Is there someone who's kind of looking at a set of policies that go? You mean coordination? Yeah. Co coordinating <laughs> policies across the government? Well, yeah. I'm wondering how much overlap there is and how much separation there is. Now, it's got to be confusing, and it's also for the yeah. vendor community. You know, where do you invest and divest to, to support it? Any thoughts on that? I mean, I think there's a quip about standards. Like the second that the standards are approved by everybody, it means it's completely irrelevant. Um, I think, uh, at least what I've seen in DOD, I mean, I think that DOD can actually kind of get its act together sometimes on some things about what, what's a good standard. Um, I don't see the government ever kind of being able to speak in one voice. I mean, they haven't been able to figure out things like security and common criteria um, in, one, in one voice, you know, what, what, what really makes things secure going forward. So I think in terms of standards, I know NIST is working on some, some cloud security kind of standards. I mean, those have, I think standards that actually have a, you know, a lot of industry involvement have a better chance of actually making do going forward. Um, and I think just frankly the biggest problem is the government doesn't really have the technical know-how anymore to know what is a good standard. Um, I, I deal a lot with sensors and usually it's only contractors in the room talking about it. Um, so I think that uh, really, um, let's say no, sorry. I mean, I, it, I think it's gonna be tough in terms of what standards going forward. I, I do think that um, the good example that you're gonna have is standards that are implemented in open source software probably have a better exam, better better chance of going forward because they're actually implemented there they can be reviewed they can be checked out um, but in terms of and hopefully built more much more quickly but I, I think the whole standards question is I haven't seen it answered yet 
and the second you get the government actually coming out in one voice saying, because it turns into a political process, it's not a technical process, usually, when the government gets involved, so. I wish it would, it was better. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, follow up on standards. Um, you mentioned experimentation is one of the three things that you're not gonna, experimentation yeah. isn't one of the three things you're not going to do. So, um, what's the threshold for OSS to make it as an accepted uh, COTS package? Um, I'm not sure if I understand, I understand your question. Open source being used? Correct. If experimentation is not. Uh, accepted. So, I, so I think experimentation in terms of like when do you actually push the deploy button? Um, I think that get, getting used to the idea that things might be, you know, if, depending on what you're building, I mean, things past a website, I think things that are, you know, in the alpha and the beta stage, um, you know, I mean, web, websites go down, services don't work, um, and actually getting people comfortable with the fact of like, you know, that's going to happen, depending on what, on what, on what you're de delivering. Now, frankly, just for the th things that I've worked on, I'd, I'd much rather have, you know, I'd re much rather be on the Amazon cloud than, than basically the small cloud I've, I've seen built inside the, the military and the intel intelligence community. Just because I can actually pay Amazon, I can fire Amazon, um, versus getting stuck with somebody who just says, yeah, we're going to go down for two days. And like, Why? Well, we can't tell you. We don't know. We're moving the servers. You know, and I think that just the whole idea of customer service, um, it's easier to kind of accept alpha and beta things are going to fail if there's actually customer service behind it. Other questions? So it's not really a question on the response to the rules, but there is a different set of examples. There are also areas of special justice and there are different sets of standards and approaches for the for the federal government so that um, it's easier for standards to be adopted throughout the federal agencies efficiently. So the federal CIO council is one. Now for open source which me being Department of the Navy, and, and I actually was a strong player in that through the Department of Navy CIO where I worked beforehand. Um, adoption of open source in the DOD isn't an issue. It's the acquisition of solutions. So open source solutions are being adopted throughout <coughs> DOD. It's our, it's our legacy acquisition approaches that is hindering our ability to embrace it at a greater scale. So, so to answer the question, I think in the corner is, isn't the hindrance isn't DOD not wanting to, it's our outdated acquisition approaches have to be corrected to be able to expand the ability to leverage open source at its most efficient level. Yeah, so, so Tim, uh, Tim Help, I should have mentioned Tim earlier, he, he helped push through and write the, the DOD, or the Department of Navy open source software policy about four years ago, I guess, or five years ago, so. Um, yeah, so I think this has all been a slow build inside the military to kind of accept that this is a good way to go. go. Um, I'm actually seeing sequestration kind of helping push that uh, push, push that further faster because people are actually looking now at their, I mean, CFOs are actually looking at their bottom lines in terms of software line items and things that are, and I tell you, software products that are basically the eight figures are really getting a hard look at like, well, why are we spending this money and could we just develop our own team to go support that? You know, the make buy decision. I mean, if you're spending 40 million on some software license for a big agency, you know, a team of 10 people, I'd say even $4 million is a lot cheaper than that license. So I, I think you're, you're going to see a lot more of this going forward in terms of agencies actually having to really think about how they spend their dollars. And do you just want to be shoveling money out the door at a, you know, for monopoly rents? Other questions? A couple more minutes. Yep, one more. Is there any oh, sorry. Is there any movement on changing the legacy procurement model to be something that's There's more agile. There's always movement on changing the legacy for procurement, and that's, and that's part of the problem, I think. I mean, I, I, frankly, I think that, um, I think it's completely broken. Um, I don't think that it's able to be fixed. Um, some people have basically been able to hack it and make it through, um, but in terms of actually making it behavior, I mean, look no further than, at least in the military, um, whenever they need like a quick, you know, a quick, they have all these rapid, rapid reaction things set up, they have expedited procurement authority to get things out there to basically buy and bring in really quickly. Um, I mean, if they need something really fast, they basically bypass all the existing rules and regulations. So it kind of shows you that things aren't working well. Um, I know I've, I've been involved with DHS and some of the other, other agencies in terms of looking at what, what they're up to as well. And um, I, I gotta tell you, I think that there's just, we've kind of overburdened ourselves with so many rules and regulations. 
that give no protection to the taxpayer that, um, you know, there's lots of talk about trying to fix it. I, I see lots of nibbling around the edges, but I don't see anybody really trying to, to grab it and change it whole, whole heartedly. I mean, outside of, and this is where I think, this is why I also think that we're going to end up in the model where everything gets outsourced. Just because it's the easier thing to do if basically you've got something up and running, you can just basically outsource it at even a million dollars a month for some service or something like that. Just say, well, it, it's all encapsulated in that product and that price, it's a lot cheaper than trying to rebuild it ourselves. That's what I think basically might break the log jam for all this stuff. And they'll probably use open source software to build those services because it's cheaper. So, I think that's about it. Oh, I think, yeah, I think the last one. <clears throat> Acquisition's going to be one big obstacle, but to complicate it, we have a catch-22 situation because, I mean, you still have to get a con on whatever you develop. And if you don't have published standards or requirements that will allow you to pass the con or receive a con, you're, you're caught in that loop. So there's, there's that part, and then there's the acquisition part. So it's, it's difficult. And I'll just be totally flip, and that's what waivers are made for. I, I just, <laughs> it's, but this is the problem, is basically there's so many systems that basically don't use a tr traditional procurement route, and then they need to get them running tomorrow, so they get a waiver. You know, and so you, the system is literally fragmented and broken down. So I think that, the, the, unfortunately, the systems that actually do try and go down the route of, of going down, getting a con, getting things up and running, going through traditional procurement, those are the ones that end up can take, you know, years and years and years and end up failing and costing billions and millions of dollars. So I think that's about it. But I think things are going well. Don't we get you down? <laughs>